Hello again and welcome back. Uh, before we get started on today's topic, I just want to go over something from last week really quick. Um, I had a couple questions asking for some clarification on the intensity versus volume principle that I talked about at the end of last week's show. Uh, so when I talk about intensity, I'm talking about things that simulate match pressure or conditions where score outcome is really your main focus. Uh, so you're going to be putting all of your technical aspects together for this without necessarily focusing on any one thing. The goal here is more to train your ability to compete and perform under stress rather than just to be able to put shots in the middle of the target. Early in the season, when volume's higher and intensity is lower, the shooter's going to be working on specific techniques like getting a consistently smooth trigger pull or working on being able to find their NPA quickly and efficiently. While you're still working diligently at trying to improve these things, it does not have the same intensity or pressure factor that you're trying to plan your training around later in the season. So being able to perform under pressure is a learned skill just like position basics. However, it isn't something someone should focus on until after they have the fundamentals down and have built up the muscle memory and subconscious ability to be able to perform them correctly without much thought, which is why you do more intensity work during the competitive phases once you have all that worked out rather than during the preparatory phases. So the basic overview overview here is that the first half of the season should focus more on the fundamentals of being able to shoot a good shot, and the second half of the season should focus more on being able to apply all of those learned fundamentals to being able to shoot a good shot under pressure and on demand. So that should pretty much cover volume versus intensity. If anybody still has questions, go ahead and leave me a comment or send me an email. Um, but as for now, we're going to move on to the actual topic of the day, which is actually more of a continuation from last week. So last week was about setting up a good strategic yearly plan, and now we're going to move into weekly and daily plans, as well as a bunch of ideas for uh, games and other fun things you could do in your practices, either by yourself or with training partners, especially for that intensity work like we were just talking about. So when we're trying to plan out our week, we're just going to be able to do it in quite a bit more detail than we plan out our year because it's happening in the here and now and it's not at some distant point in the future. So first of all, how much are you going to train? This is going to vary uh, quite a bit depending on your particular situation. For example, if you're a junior and your club only gets four hours of range time every week split up across two days or something like that, then you're going to be more limited than someone like an NCAA athlete who has range access practically every every day. And a shameless plug here for the University of Alaska, you can train on that range practically any time of day, whereas some schools restrict you to only being able to train certain hours. Uh, it's, it's really flexible up there, which is nice. Anyway, oh, and if you're one of those people who don't have frequent access to a range or whatever your situation is, if it's like that, you can you can try what I did back in high school, which was to find a 10 meter length in my house somewhere. I had it in the basement and I put up a target that I could dry fire on, or even better yet, you can get a scat. Uh, the new ones are pretty expensive, but if you get an older one, which is what I ended up doing, if you get an older one, or if it's used, then you can probably get a pretty good deal and it's still gonna work pretty well for you. Um, even if you don't have 10 meters, I'm, I'm sure you have 5 meters, and you can set up a reduced size target at 5 meters so it looks pretty much the same through your sights as the 10 meter target or a 50 meter target normally does. And I'm pretty sure that if you do get a scat machine, they do work down to 5 meters, although you should probably check that. I think it's 5 meters, but could be wrong. Anyway. So determine how much range or dry fire time you have available to you, and then once you've done that, determine how much of it you want to use that is appropriate to your goals and other commitments, whatever else you have going on in your life. So as a junior, combining the little amount of actual range time that I was get, able to get with the dry firing I did in my basement, I was probably on the gun for 10 hours a week, which isn't too difficult to do. Um, you can go down in the I did. I went down in the basement for an hour and a half or two hours every day after school or before school, 
and that's it. That's five days, and that's ten hours. So you even get days off that way, which you should have days off because otherwise you're going to burn yourself out and lose motivation. So always make sure to leave one or two days off in there. Uh, as a college shooter, I was easily in the range. If I combined my range time and my gym time, um, that was easily 20 to 25 hours a week. About 16 of that was physically on the gun. So again, this is going to vary depending on your commitment to the sport, your schedule, if you have a job, how many classes you're taking, and the list goes on with as many things as you can think of. So now we figured out the basics. We know what day we're going to shoot, or what days we're going to shoot, and how much we plan to be on the gun. And now we, what we do is consult our yearly plan and what phase you're currently in to determine what you should be working on in general. Are you supposed to be working on basic technique or are you supposed to be working on intensity drills, or is it some combination of the two? You may plan in a record day at the end of the week to test yourself on your progress and implement what you've been working on that week into a match-like scenario. That's often a good thing to do. Or maybe, depending on what what your schedule is like, what your season is, what stage of your season you're in, um, you might want to have two or three record days that week. Uh, you're also going to want to build your workouts into your weekly plan. It's just nice to have those scheduled, and it helps you actually go to the gym, something I struggle with personally. <laughs> okay, so now we have our weekly plan down, and it's day one. So let's get into the down and dirty on how to conduct a productive and efficient training session. The first thing you need to do is determine what skill you're working on in that practice and define your success and how that's going to be measured so that you'll always leave practice feeling like you accomplished something and feeling positive. Nobody likes to leave the range feeling disappointed with how they did or something like that. So always be able to measure what you did and have it be a positive outcome. So here's an example of what I mean by this. Let's say on a particular day I want to work on my endurance in the kneeling position. So I'm going to define my success as being able to stay down in position and work through the pain for X amount of time. If my scores start to drop off towards the end of the session, that's fine. It's not what I'm working on per se, and it isn't how I've defined my success for that day, so it isn't going to make me upset or discourage me or anything like that. I showed up to work on my endurance primarily. I stayed down there for whatever amount of time I wanted to be down there for, and tomorrow when I come in, I know that I'm going to be able to do either that same thing easier or maybe even be able to stay in position longer. So I still was successful in achieving my goals for that practice. Another example, if I'm working on my whatever position, say air rifle position and my gun setup, I'll define my success as finding adjustments so that the gun feels more balanced and making my position more solid. So. If I go to shoot some shots towards the end of my practice and they aren't immediately fantastic, that's fine. And it, again, is not going to make me angry or upset because I know that I accomplished my daily goal of improving my gun adjustments and position and that these things are going to help me over time. So it was a, it was a successful practice. Now that particular example is actually something that just happened yesterday when I was helping out a junior shooter with his air gun position. We made a bunch of changes, and he said that it seemed to feel quite a bit better. Um, but when he got back in position and took a few shots, uh, they probably weren't as good as he wanted them to be, and I could sense there was a little bit of discouragement there. So it's important to, like I said, define success as something other than just your scores so that you can avoid those kind of feelings. Because in the case of that kid, we did make a lot of progress, and those changes are definitely going to help him improve but improvement takes time. Uh, one resource I suggest you take advantage of is called a Ticket to Train. Uh, there's a one-page document that can be found on the USA Shooting website uh, regarding this. So you go to Resources, and then click on Downloads, and it's going to be right there towards the top. It's titled Ticket to Train Worksheet. You'll open it up, and it's a one-page sheet, and you'll note there are three important sections. The first one you fill out before practice, and you write down what your performance goals or what performance goal you're going to be working on is that day and specifically how you're going to do it. Then part two you do after your session and then there's a note section where you can write down any technical details or 
whatever else you want to keep track of. So let's run through a quick example. So in my example here, the performance goal I want to work on is my trigger control in air rifle. I'm going to do two things to, to accomplish this. First, I'm going to spend a bunch of time dry firing while looking over the top of the sights toward the target in position, focusing on the feeling of the trigger and get a good contact between the trigger shoe and the appropriate place on my finger and squeezing straight to the back with no pressure you know to the side I want my trigger pressure to come straight back in line with the stock so the benefit of doing this while looking over the top of your sights rather than through the sights at the target is that you're taking away the visual stimulus of trying to get a perfect sight picture so that you only have to focus on the one task at hand, which in this instance is your trigger control. You're developing that perfect trigger control through this exercise as a conscious skill. You're thinking about it directly, which is going to make it subconscious with enough repetition. So you should really do it for maybe 15 or 30 minutes before you ever even look through the sights over the course of a few weeks to do this and it's going to help you get that muscle memory down so that when the time comes to shoot real shots you can focus solely on your balance and a perfect sight picture and you can be sure that your brain is going to automatically execute that trigger pull which you've worked to perfect through this conscious training. Okay so that was the first specific thing I'm going to do in this training session to work on my defined performance goal of the day of improving my trigger control. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot some scat and I'm going to watch my trace very closely after each shot and pay extra special attention to the last second before the shot breaks. If the line stays consistent and the shot breaks right over the hold then I probably have excellent trigger control on that shot. If I notice, on the other hand, that in the last half, or like in the last half second or so, um, the trace jumps off the main part of your hold and your shot ends up being off center, then that's probably a trigger control issue and I still have work to do. And just so you know, pretty much everyone still has at least a little bit of work to do on this particular skill. In fact, I was just working on these exercises this afternoon in my own practices. Um, Anyway, so continuing on filling out this worksheet with our example. Um, in the after training part of the worksheet, I just fill out what I did, how it went, and what I need to do to improve further next time if I want to continue this in my next training session. And then if I have any notes to write down, then I'll write them down, and now I'm done. So that's your ticket to train example. I suggest you make good use of it. It's an excellent way to organize things. Um, a quick note though, even if you don't use this physical worksheet before every session, at least go through the steps in your journal or in your head. Um, a shooting practice without a defined goal can be largely a waste of time, or at least much less useful and productive than one where you're working on something specific. Even if it's a practice match, you can work on something specific, maybe something like rhythm, good shot rejection, focus and concentration, or anything else along those lines. Okay, so here's the last part of the show. Everyone's always looking for new or different ways that they can practice skills or do intensity training. So here are what I have either had suggested to me by coaches or other shooters or came up with on my own for this. And uh, there are quite a few of them. So I'm just going to kind of read them off here. Uh, the first one is shot calling. So this is done with teams of two. One shooter fires without observation. They can't see their target. Um, the partner marks... The shooter's call on a blank target as well as the actual hit. And the shooter gets one point for the correct ring and one point for the correct hour on the clock face. And you can vary this depending on the skill level of the shooters, of course. Um, another one, here you can do this by yourself if you are confident enough. It's called Eyes Closed, and this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you hold on the target, look through your sights, and then while you're looking through your sights as a target, close your eyes for three seconds and pull the trigger. Are your shots near the center? Has your NPA shifted? So do this one if you really want to test your NPA and probably are not shooting on an electronic target. <laughs> okay, here's another one if you're shooting on a paper target. Um, cut out the center. 
you can cut out the 8 ring for air rifle, or whatever ring you want to cut out, depending on your skill level, and shots that go through the hole that you've cut that don't cut the edge are considered 10s. So this is going to help you kind of gain confidence in your ability to shoot deep shots, and every time you do this, you can cut out a smaller and smaller and smaller hole. Here's another one. Uh, it's called White Point Game. Shooters get 3 to 10 targets and shoot at each target until the entire white dot or 10, ten ring is removed. The winner is the one with the fewest attempts. Here's the next one. It's called Trump. Two shooters shoot alternating shots. The shooter with the closest or the shot closest to the center wins the round. The winner is the one who wins the majority of the rounds. And this can be done out of as many shots as you want. It can be done out of 10 series, 20 series, 40 series, whatever you want to do. Um, this game is called 10th series. And this is where shooters are going to shoot several series of 10 shots each. And you're going to evaluate your target in 10ths which is, I guess, the normal scoring now for air rifle and prone. Uh, the winner is the one with the highest evaluation for each series, and then you get a point for each series. So at the end, compare points. Um, you can play tennis with shooting if you or if several shooters know the rules of tennis. Um, you just do it with shooting. So six games is a set, and the serve changes with each game. A 10.7 or better is a service ace. And the variation is that only shots, or a variation you can use on this game is that only shots above a certain value count. So, for example, you have to shoot a 10.2 in order for your shot to count. Okay, here's another one. It's called Without Eight. The shooter tries to shoot as many shots as possible on one target without injuring the eight ring, or seven ring, or six ring, depending on your skill level. And the winner is the one with the most shots before they hit that. Here's one called Fox Hunt. This is done with a large group of people. So you take one of the weaker shooters and they get to shoot one shot before everyone else. And then this is, they're considered the fox and that's their lead. That's the fox's lead. So all the other shooters and the fox then shoot 10 shots under finals commands trying to catch the fox. The winner is the fox if no one catches him or her with the lead they got off that extra shot. Here's one called 40 tens, or a variation. Who can shoot 40 tens in the fewest number of shots? Or 30 tens or 20 tens, or whatever you want to do. You can do this against yourself as well. Keep track and try to beat yourself from one practice day to the next. Points per hour. Who can create the most points in 60 minutes, or 30 minutes, or 20 minutes, or 10 minutes? Uh, training matches and finals, of course. Um, here's one called Precision Delay. Uh, you shoot 10 shots, each shot at an interval of 2 minutes. So let's say you take your first shot at 10 o'clock. You can't take your next shot until 10.02. You can't take your next shot until 10.04. So you can either... <coughs> sorry. You can either do this against a direct opponent or, again, against a personal record. And here what you're doing is you're purposefully messing up your rhythm so that you have to get back and figure out how to get a good shot off, even though you've had a two-minute delay in there. So then there's you can do speed drills. So, for example, you have to shoot 10 shots in eight minutes or 10 shots in six minutes, and you have to set a score goal for those if you want to. I mean, you can do any variations on any of these that you want. So here's one variation for any of the above if you're shooting against another person. So the faster, like, if you're shooting... Between two people, you each take one shot at a time. So the person who shoots their shot the fastest get fastest gets an extra two tenths of a point or something like that. Uh, you can shoot a final with ISSF results if you have someone announcing for you. So then you can compete against or compete in your mind against the best in the world essentially. Um, or you can do if you have a lot of people again an elimination competition also known as a guts match. This is where everyone returns to zero after every shot, and someone is eliminated after every shot. Lowest shot is eliminated. Now, there's another game which I guess doesn't really have a name. It's I've only ever heard it, heard it referred to as 10 fives and 10 sevens, um, and you can vary this based on your skill level, but this is the one that, that I do and a lot of the people I train with do. Um, you have to shoot... 
10, 10 fives or above. And then once you have shot 10, 10 fives and above, you now have to shoot five, 10 sevens or above. And you try to do this in the fewest number of shots as possible. I think my record's somewhere around 20, and that was an excellent day, of course. But I think normally it's around 30 or 40. So that's kind of a fun one to do. So this last one also doesn't have a name, and it is a little bit more complicated. And the purpose of it is twofold. First, to get you used to stringing good shots in a row, so you build that confidence up that you can do it. And also to work on shooting good last shots, which a lot of people struggle with. So here's how it works. You have to shoot strings of tens each time increasing your string by one shot. So for the first string that you do, if you want to call it that, is a, it's a one shot string. So you shoot one shot or one ten, then congratulations, you have that string accomplished and you can now move on to a two shot ten string. So if you shoot your two shot ten string, congratulations, move on to three and so on. But here's the catch, if at any point in one of those strings you have anything other than a 10, you have to start the whole string over again, and the further you progress along in the game, the more pressure this puts on you, especially on those last shots of the string. So if you're on, for example, the last shot of your 7 shot 10 string, you really don't want to have 9 and have to start all over again on that, sh on that 7 shot 10 string, because it's going to take a while, so you have it forces you to build up that mental fortitude to be able to work through the pressure and shoot a good shot. So that's one of my favorites. Okay, so that's all I have for you for now. I hope you can apply some of these ideas to your own practice and have a great week.